Hello, my name is Chad Dontremont and I am the Executive Director of the Rennie Center for Education Research and Policy. It is my privilege to introduce the Condition of Education 2021 Community Panel. The Condition of Education in the Commonwealth Project represents the Rennie Center's firm commitment to building an effective system in Massachusetts that equitably and effectively serves all students, especially those who have been historically marginalized. While we pursue a range of activities throughout the year to achieve this goal, the Condition of Education project is largely centered on three activities. One, an updated data dashboard tracking indicators from early childhood through higher education to assess the state's progress. Two, an action guide to elevate promising practices across Massachusetts and suggest policies that can be acted on immediately to improve student opportunities and outcomes. And three, a public release of our findings for examination and discussion by the field. Our work would not be possible without the contributions of countless education leaders and practitioners across the state who are willing to open their doors and allow us to better understand the work they are doing. They have shown us generosity by giving of their time and expertise to share successes they have achieved. And they have shown courage by speaking honestly about the challenges they continue to face. This year, the COE Action Guide examines the integration of learning across communities and how schools and other educational organizations and individuals invested in students' learning, growth, and well being can work together to help all students succeed. This community panel presents an opportunity to hear directly from a number of the programs featured in our work. Because, in short, rather than hear from me or the Rennie Center team, it's best to hear from the experts themselves. I am honored to introduce our panel. Dr. Almi Abieta, Superintendent at Chelsea Public Schools. Dr. Pam Edinger, President at Bunker Hill Community College. Ann Candalis, Director, Springfield Works. And Tiffany Lilly, Director of Community Resource Development in Framingham Public Schools. Dr. Edinger will serve as the moderator for this panel discussion. Before turning it over to Pam, I do want to say a few thank yous. In the slide in front of you, you will see on the right-hand side, the all of the program exemplars that are featured in this year's action guide. Thanks to the Benjamin Banneker Charter School, Bunker Hill Community College, Chelsea Public Schools, Framingham Public Schools, Met Regional Career and Technical Center, National Parent Leadership Institute, Rhode Island Learning Community, Somerville Public Schools, and Springfield Works. And on the left, I also want to acknowledge the Rennie Center supporters. The Condition of Education Project is supported by a 50-member advisory committee. Individual names and organization affiliations are on our website. And the thank you to all of them, far too many to mention, for all of their support in helping ensure expertise and experience is leveraged in our research findings. A shout out as well to Julia Freeland Fisher at the Clayton Christensen Institute and Dr. Karen Mapp at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, both of who contributed their expertise as well to the findings that we have included in the report. And then finally, a few special thank yous for some names that are not on the slide. I want to acknowledge Sinead Chalmers, Sophie Zamaripa, and Nena Bala, who work at the Rennie Center, are the leads on this project and deserve full credit for all of the information that will be shared. And of course, thank the Rennie Center Board for its leadership and the funders who support the Rennie Center's work and allow us to actually make this project available available to the field. Thank you to all of them. This work is possible because of their efforts and their commitment. And with that, Pam, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Chad. And, and again, I want to welcome our, our three distinguished panelists. And I'm going to start our discussion today by asking each one of them to spend a couple minutes um, to, to, to talk about um, there are uh, the key initiatives uh, that they would like to mention and then our discussion with each one of our panelists um, ongoing will, will involve three key themes. Uh, the, the three key themes that runs through this condition of education report, including holistic learning, shared leadership, and multiple pathways to careers. So let's, um, let's begin uh, with Dr. Adeta. How are you? I just wanted to 
share a little bit about what um, we are, we initiated in Chelsea. And, and due to the pandemic, we were trying to think about how, how do we engage our community? How do we engage our families in um, during this time of remote learning? And so our focus is on community, family and community engagement in the Chelsea Public Schools. Oh, I, I was muted there for a minute. Uh, let me invite Anne to begin next on uh, the, the work that she's doing at uh, Springfield Works. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Ann Candelis. I'm the director of Springfield Works. It's a community-wide initiative with the Economic Development Council of Western Mass. The initiative was created in 2016 as part of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston Working Cities Challenge to create economic opportunity for low-income families. So our vision for Springfield is to have thriving communities where economic opportunity, growth, and resilience is possible for all. We know the global pandemic really exposed, you know, historic patterns of segregation and disinvestment in Springfield, which were already there, but have um, certainly effectively blocked opportunities for many communities. So Springfield Works is helping our community build pathways to opportunity um, with five overarching community-wide strategies, which I won't get, get into now. We'll talk more about those. But achieving that vision of opportunity for all really requires ongoing collaborative work to remove systemic and racial barriers and create pathways to economic opportunity and well-being. So I'll, I'll pause there. All right, thank, thank you, you Anne. And, and next, I'm going to invite Tiffany, um, who is the Director of Community Resource Development at the Framingham Public Schools. Tell us a little about, about your focus, um, Tiffany. Hello, and thank you for having me. My focus with Framingham Public Schools as the Director of Community Resource Development is we oversee all the out-of-school time programs for the district, as well as many of the community partnerships. Um, Framingham is a very diverse community and has a large immigrant population. It has, it's very much the tale of two cities with high affluence and very low income. And so our model for our department was really to design programming that reflects the community. So we have a variety of fee-based programming and programming funded by the district and grants, and we'll get into it later, but it really is driven by our community partners. And so our district is about 10,000 students and we oversee programming for about 3,000 of those students, 12 months a year, morning, after school, evening. So it's a good time in Framingham. <laughs> Thank it, you for it does sound me. like that. that, that sounds wonderful. So, so let's spend the, the next half an hour or so digging a little deeper into each one of the uh, um, of the programs that our um, that our panelists brings to the table. Let's start with um, Dr. Albeta. Uh, Almi, as the superintendent of Chelsea Public Schools, you've led efforts to engage families through work like work like the co-design project featured in our report. So, what do you see as the key benefits to engaging families as equal partners in their children's schooling? Um, I always I have a a view of education when it comes to really working with our community and our families. And it's one of, we come alongside. So I, I strongly believe that parents are our partners and that our parents are the first teacher of teachers of children, of their children. So they oftentimes know more about their children than we do. And so we need to tap into that wonderful, the wonderful resource of parents so that we can learn more about our students. And so when we're talking about co-design, the philosophy of co-design and the whole heart of it is that we're not doing two families. Um, oftentimes there's a power dynamic family come into schools and it's like, I'm the educator or I'm the principal or I'm the teacher and, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're the parent and you're going to hear what I have to say about your child, like in a parent to their conference. So with code design, what we're doing is we're, we're shifting, we're shifting the, the, the power dynamic and saying parents are our, our partners, parents are, 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 are we're coming alongside and how do we make 
our, how do we help our parents become the experts? And so in co-design, we're co-planning. And so one example is we rolled out some uh, new report cards and we have the curriculum and instruction office working with a group of parents on how, how to explain the new report card in remote learning to, uh, to families. And so we have a, a beautiful example of a teacher and a parent creating a video together about the report card and, sh and the teacher is sharing about the report card side by side along with the parent. And then the parent, it flips the switch and then we get, it's bilingual and then we go and the parent leads the Spanish one. And so then the parent becomes the teacher of the parents. And so we're, we empower the families, our families, our parents, and we're saying, we value you, please, you are the expert too. And then we use our, our parents will become now the teachers. And so it's really shifting the paradigm. We're doing this in many areas. We also have, um, so that's just another one example. Our ELL office is working on some co-design with parents and families and our, spe our special education advisory is working on some co-designs. And these are our, um, um, ideas that are popping from the parents and the educators working together. And so if you, there's a, we have the video like of the report card on our website so anyone can view this um, video of the, of the parent and, and the teacher doing and the explanation of our new report cards. <laughs> Wow, that, that is really terrific. I mean, I wish when I was going to school that somebody had done that for my family, right? Particularly it being bilingual and, and, and having that kind of access for um, the family and the community. How are the students reacting to it? Our students are also becoming part of the code design and, and we're, are working with us. And so I, I believe that our students are, are watching their parents become more involved in their um, school. And so it, it really brings a, self, a, a sense of, even though we're in remote learning, there's still community. Yes. And we're really trying to emphasize that now during, during a remote learning because our students haven't been in school, the physical building for 10 months now. And so that's why we put such a heavy emphasis on co-design, really reaching out to families because we believe that if we reach out to families and if we engage our families, we're going to have better attendance with remote learning. We're going to have less students falling through their cracks, and we're going to have better overall student achievement. That that is a terrific example of share leadership. I thank you, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's let's for um, the our, our our next piece of the conversation turn to Anne. Um, and the, the work that you do at Springfield Works is dedicated to a two generation model of whole family development. Can you talk a little about what an effective two generation model looks like and, and, and how supporting the development of adults is as important as that of their children? You know, I first, I first came across a two gen model when I was working on a project, and I, I will define what 2J means in a minute, but I was working on a project with Educare. So Educare is a holiday early education model across the country, and we have one in Springfield. And I saw this model with uh, working in low income communities in Atlanta and Washington DC and Oklahoma. And and a light bulb went off. And this is even before I joined Springfield Works. So when, when we look at our greatest resources, it's our people. But the way our policies and programs work can either block or unlock the full potential of our adults and our children. So 
what we were looking at is, you know, how do we create the conditions that support children's healthy development while supporting the adults in their lives at the same time? So everyone benefits. So in Springfield, over 30 organizations in education, programming, service providers, and business are collaborating and updating their practice programs and services so that the needs of both children and their caregivers are addressed together. So we call this a two generation or a whole family approach. And it allows parents to focus on making the most of their education, job training and work opportunities while their children's development is being supported. I loved hearing uh, Dr. Abeda talk about the parent design, the co-design, because that's exactly what two gen models are. They vary widely. Um, and, and, but an effective two-gen model must be family-centered. Its design emphasizes the importance of using family goals to target individual family members. So then you set individual goals and align and tailor appropriate solutions. So this lens really prioritizes relationship building over programs and and, and designing sort of these flexible evaluation approaches. So while, so, so what's working is that systems change is really working to support families, whole families in their efforts. So some of the really important elements are, you know, you have to have great partners. Um, this model has been around a long time, uh, but Springfield Works was really inspired by the Aspen Institute and the Annie E. Casey Foundation and based its theory of change model to combine parent and child interventions, emphasizing education, economic support, social capital, and health and well being. So that creates this legacy of economic security that should pass from one generation to the next. Just, just real quickly, our um, you know, we, 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 we designed this, the original pilot was just small. We wanted to just test it in 2019. We saw that programs that were so disconnected and services were so disconnected that we really needed to, to shift what we were doing so that the burden of support belongs to the providers and, 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 the, and the partners and, and not the families to try to, you know, um, um, work through the maze of, of complex systems. And so what I, what I love about, um, I mean, one example, and I'm going to give you one that I, I didn't plan on only because when I heard, when, when we talk about remote learning, our most recent cohort, uh, um, our 2020 cohort, it had to go all, all remote. Um, so now the parents are home and the family and, and the kids are home and they're remote learning. And what was so great, well, at the beginning, the plan was for physical learning. That's when we started the program. We had to redesign the whole thing. And the important element, because it was a family design program, we started with digital literacy. We had to, we had to start with equipment access and how to use the equipment. And so we revamped the program and, and, th and this was for the adults. So many who have never worked before were unemployed. Now they're gonna go through a workforce development program, financial literacy. It's a pretty intense 84 hours of training. And when we started with the digital literacy, it just, it just made the whole family that much better. Most of the, our programs, when they're not connected in the way that this one was with families in mind and the family design, you know, we expected to, to lose people, but we revamped the schedule. So we had shorter days and lengthened the time of the programming so they could be with their families while they're, because all the kids are at home. And 91% of our families completed the program. It was incredible. And, you know, I'll, I'll share with you just a video of some of their comments later, but they, um, the, the success of the whole family, the kids are doing better. Um, they're logging in. They've, 
you know, part of the training was also healthy parenting um, and, and relationship skills. So, so we had healthy parenting, relationship skills, and, um, and workforce readiness. And they all passed their National Career Readiness Certificate, which is no joke. It's not an easy program. The program curriculum was designed with our two community colleges, STCC, Springfield Technical Community College, and HCC, uh, which is Holyoke uh, Community College, in the training and workforce options. So the partners and leadership really made a difference. Holyoke, Chicopee, Springfield, Head Start, uh, Dress for Success, they have a foot in the door program, that curriculum, again, that I mentioned with the training and workforce options. And then our community action organization, Springfield Partners, we all came together to design the program and deliver the program together with the families. The important, another important element of two gen is that each family has to be supported at the agency level. So in this case, it was Head Start and the Head Start Family Service Coordinators who also received two gen training prior to the launch. So that's another important element. I think the public schools and even the community colleges have, you know, sort of this agency holistic view and it can be a, a wonderful partner in launching two gen programs that can be designed based on the resources you have in your community and, and, the, and the resources that families need. So collaboration and partnership are clearly two really important elements. So barrier mitigation becomes part of the model. All those segments, even though they're delivered by different partners and they already existed in our community are delivered to the family together. So they're learning how to manage their cliff effect benefits, you know, when they start to work and their benefits fall off so fast. Um, they learn, again, healthy parenting skills. So all of that is together and, and the mitigation of childcare and transportation and other, other barriers are managed with the team, with the two gen team. So the providers, the case managers and Springfield Works leads uh, you know, is sort of the, the overall agency that brings uh, different partners together, depending on who we're serving and, and, and what programs families are receiving. Wow, that, that is a huge amount of coherence and bringing all the resources together for almost like a collective impact, right? That, that's really it's terrific. Collective impact. Yeah, what, what is the scale? How many families are you serving now? Right now, it's small um, because... Um, because of COVID, but we are serving 31 families. Um, we have and we have many others that went through other programs that were sort of layering on a two gen approach. So there's about 30, 30 additional families like that. Um, but the ones who really came in from 2019 and 2020. Um, we actually, I actually, we have, yeah, we have about 22 families actually from those two cohorts. Um, and, and we have a plan for scaling. Scaling is tough, uh, but it's all about the partners. Oh, that, that's really terrific. Thank you, Anne. We, we will loop back to you um, as, we, as we have more of these conversations that it seems to me that, that there's real resonance, you know, as I go to one panelist to the next, that we really do have a, 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 an emerging theme that, that, that that partnerships are better, collaboration is better, and convergence is, is the best. So, so let's, let's turn to Tiffany. Um, Tiffany, I know that um, you, it, Tiffany, I know that you had noted before the program started that Framingham Public Schools serves close to 10,000 students. T tell me what your role is in, 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 in your work and, and, and how, how your programs are working. Um, I, I know that, um, that supporting community and family members for holistic learning and growth is really at the center of what you do. So talk about the positive outcomes you've seen um, in the models that you built, um, particularly in the um, in-house the, in the in out-of-school time opportunities. Absolutely. So yeah, the, the district is, is medium-sized, you know, but it's very much an urban district. And I think that 
when I came in, I started about five years ago, we were, we had recently done a strategic plan initiative and our district operated as many others do with programs that are run by community partners within the building. And what we were seeing was, you know, challenges in addressing equity with the models as such. And so we really needed to think about how do we partner together in order to really provide comprehensive programming for all students. So, you know, when you have community partners in the building as the sole vendor, it, it can be challenging to better support them in serving students with special needs, bilingual students, students that really need additional accommodations and support. And so my, um, my mission coming in <laughs> clearly indicated by our superintendent at the time and our director was um, to really roll out an in-house model of out-of-school time programs. It had existed in fragmented ways, I would say, or in piecemealed ways. And so we were, the goal of kind of rolling out our programs was essentially with that equity lens in mind around, A, how do we develop a model that is comprehensive in nature, that is inclusive of all the other departments and district-wide initiatives, right? So that it's it's really one full day for the student. Um, students are in our buildings from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. with the out-of-school time models. So a big piece of that was developing a model that we could provide equity in terms of, you know, so we make sure that we can provide additional supports for students on IEPs, students with 504 plans. We've had students that have one-to-one -one nurses. We've had, um, students that have translation support during programming, especially for our newcomers. And so all of that was, was kind of the vision. And I think that a big piece of that is like, we are certainly stronger together. And, and how do we, now that we've developed these resources interdistrict around, I would say at the very minimum, a culture that out of school time is a district program and a culture that we all buy into, right? So like the special education, education director is very much on the same page with me and working on how to support our students and beyond the bell, right? And so that's a big piece. And what we were finding was as we were rolling that out is we were hiring community partners to come in and provide programming within our model. So that really, you know, we don't need to be the, the everything to everyone every time. I think that that's really important is that we have community stakeholders that have been doing this work for a very long time. And so how do we really blend the models? So that was a big piece is hiring community partners to also come in and provide programming alongside us. And then the other piece is that there are many community providers that provide out of school time programming at their own locations. And so the through the pandemic, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, that really kind of shifted the focus around how are we really distributing and sharing our resources to make sure that everyone has that. And that like I came from out of district, I came from nonprofits and I worked within the municipality in Cambridge. And so I working within a school department doing out of school time programs, I'm like, this is like the data mother load, you know, you have access to the systems that like you've always dreamed of, of, you know, just accessing an IEP or a 504 plan or calling up the teacher and being like, hey, it's me, your colleague. I think that those are really invaluable in terms of student success. And what I was realizing is as I was benefiting from all this in-district privilege, that the community partners haven't had that access. And so that really has been a big goal of ours in the last year um, is to create stronger communication between our providers, our principals, and all of our teachers. And that, you know, and COVID has taught us all of that at the, the deep value of our out of school time providers and our community providers in general, right? It's not, and so it, I think that's been a big piece. And so my oversight of that has really been in growing the programs and growing the oversight and the model. And when I started, we had about two programs with about like 30 staff and we've grown in, in, in the last four years, um, with about 18 programs and about 200 staff. And so the, that means, you know, how do we measure? I think Pam, you had said earlier, it's like, how do you measure the success of this? And the natural like education answer is, well, there's a lot of ways. And so there's the intangible, there's the tangible. And, you know, the district uses panorama surveys to measure student school climate as many districts do. And 
that was a big piece because at a school time, you know, is an intervention. It is an intervention seen as many others that really help close the disparities and the achievement gap and really support student growth. And so we are not just using academic data. We wanted to make sure we were capturing the social emotional learning data because SEL is a, is a huge priority of the district. So we were seeing our cohorts of students and we did a data collection um, from students that were attending before and after five days a week and then students that were attending two days a week. And so we would see numbers of students, you know, scaling 20% higher than their peers, um, which like when you're talking about, for those who have used these surveys, like you're talking about like 4% is like awesome, right? But we were seeing almost 20% on some students and and just their growth around feeling safe, having a trusted adult in the building, engaging with peers in positive and appropriate ways. So that for us was like, okay, we're on the right track, you know? And as like a data geek myself, you need like three to five years of high quality data to really, you know, continue to promote that. So that also showed us our gaps, you know, around the middle school level, because again, we do pre-K through high school. So at the elementary level, the panorama data was really helpful for us. And at the middle school level, it was helpful in the ways in which we were trying to understand like where students were really struggling with peer relationships and, that also showed us how to like we thinking about other metrics to kind of unpack that right so if the safety if students feel safe within their school building that percentage point was much lower than you would see at elementary and so for us we know that middle school students are dealing with bullying and targeting and you know just complex identity issues so we were able to then you know extrapolate that and look at discipline data and office referral data to kind of see where our goals need to be with those pieces so anyways, I won't, I won't bore you with all the data conversations, but I would say it's, it's a little bit of everything. And I think that that's, um, you know, trying to develop programs and design models that are sustainable, but are truly reflective in practice, because we need to stay abreast of what the students' needs are and what the students, you know, culturally are and developmentally, as well as just, just purely speaking in terms of enrichment. So we have used all of the things and I think that we're still evolving as it goes. So we're looking at attendance data, social emotional learning data, pre and post surveys, academic iReady data. We use the diagnostics for assessments. And so it's a little bit of everything, but I think it really allows us to go granularly by school, by program, where does this program sit? And what are the goals that we're collectively working on by program? And, and how are we then sharing that with partners, right? Because partners don't have the luxury of working in one building with one, you know, with one cohort. It really is, they're like, we've got all 10 schools here. Or, you know, we've got all the schools coming to the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA. And so that really is where we are in our journey is, okay, what do you need as a community provider for access? Because that's really what we need to talk about in terms of moving forward. So, so how are your parents and, 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 and the children um, doing in all of this? Um, are, are they, are they, when you report back all this wonderful progress, um, how are they reacting? Um, well, our enrollment continues to grow. So I think that's like a, a general piece, but I think the we're probably not as good at promoting our successes as we are like on the ground, I'll be honest, you know, like we're, we're in it to win it. And I think that we're not always great at like doing, you know, the data presentation pieces with our families. And I think our families have a sense of the value and kind of, and we survey them as well. And they're very much part of our organizing committees, but we've seen our programs grow. So at every school that had, you know, a vendor beforehand or things like that, we've seen our numbers just astronomically grow from, you know, we had one program that had 30 students and now has over 120 per wow. day. Um, our middle school programs have, you know, two to 300 students staying after per day. And I think that when we look at that for us is like the intangible. And, you know, we yeah. sent an email to parents actually earlier this week saying, or last week saying, hey, you know, we have an incoming parent, uh, incoming parent event for kindergarten parents. would love to do a parent panel. You know, let us know if you're interested in joining a parent panel and like immediate emails pouring in talking about, you know, it's, it's really a culture and a family that we're trying to grow into. And so not necessarily a tangible measure, is really that community development aspect of it is really 
making sure that the access that we have is distributed throughout our community and that our partners are also benefiting from the supports and the access that we have from being part of the school department and from professional development to access to data and, and so on. Oh, that, that's, that's terrific. Okay, so now that we know a little bit, well, actually quite a bit about the work that the three of you do, I've got a couple of questions that, that I would like to ask all three of you. And maybe what we'll do is we'll rotate in the same order that we had uh, done the initial, the, the initial round. So the first question I have for all of you is that what do you see as the keys to helping students, family, and communities re-engage with the educational system um, in ways that rebuilds trust and, and push the system forward rather than going back to what used to be, you know, the pre-COVID normal. Uh, COVID is a pretty defining moment, right, in, 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 our, in our educational lives. Um, so, t t well, let's start with, um, with, uh, with Elmi. Um, what, what, what is it? What is it that, what are the key elements that you see? I think the key elements are when we engage our families, um, we're also, it's, it's a way of our families will hold us accountable. And so I think that's so important that that accountability comes from, from our families, our parents saying, you know, we want to make sure our kids are receiving the highest and the best quality of education possible. And so when our families are engaged, they also hold me as a superintendent accountable. They hold our educators accountable. So really it's that, it, it's that building that, that dynamic of, of we're here, we welcome our, our doors, and we want to co-partner so that way we can do the very best to meet the needs of our students. And, and in doing so, you, we create a dynamic where we're improving instruction because at the end of the day, families send their children to school and they're trusting us. And, and they, send a, they, they send us their, love, their, their children and they're saying, here, educate. And, and, and normally that's how it is. And, and, and what we're saying is we're gonna partner with you and we want the best for your, for your child. And we're gonna make sure we do this together. We're gonna make sure that we educate in hand, in tandem with you um, because every child, every parent has a dream for their child. And so we, we wanna make sure that we're doing the best by our families, by building that relation, building those relationships and building trust. All right. So, so Anne, for for Almi, it is keeping her doors open to continue to co-design, to invite parents in, to 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 be part of to be part of the team. That's how she builds trust. How do you build trust? You know, one of the at, at the 2019 cohort graduation, coincidentally. And this was when we were all able to celebrate together in a room. Um, interestingly, one of the waitresses was a teacher at the elementary school. She, this was her night job to put her child through nursing school. She came up to me after and said, why aren't we doing this for the parents of the kids who, are, who go to my school? They're broken. She said, they drop them off and that's it, and we don't know what happens after that. And so unfortunately, you know, while the inclusion of two, two generations seems like a common sense approach, two gen programming is, is really not that common. So it looks like it is, but services that provide adult education and skills training often view children as a barrier to participation and don't adequately address childcare as a major barrier to completing you know, a college education or, or a certification program or a GED. Similarly, you know, the programs that focus on educating children often view parents merely as the facilitators of children's education, but I like hearing here that they also view them as their first and most important teacher. So I loved hearing that. I think, 
I think um, the, the trust factor and maybe one of the things to consider from the school, what, what we also learned in our community is that we have a ton of programs. We are rich in programs and poor in systems. And so when I listen to like Tiffany talking, like some of the work can be done, not even in the school, it just having access to the parent, you wouldn't even have to facilitate. So let's say Hoyo Community College has a sterile processing training. We wanna have access to the parents to, to do workforce development, um, but, it's, but it goes beyond that, right? First, we, we, we work with parents and, 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 um, and the case manager or the agency to look at, is the parent really ready, willing, and able to work at this point? And our community actually defined what that means. So let's say um, a parent, you know, oftentimes what happens is an agency will just refer them to a training program, but they really don't have an adequate childcare plan or adequate transportation. And so what happens on the front end of the two gen work is, is really to sort of do this pre-work with a parent to, to ensure that they really are ready for training and work. I mean, how many parents do you know have been in and out of training? Or just look at your participation ratios when times are tough. The fact that we had a 91% completion rate really showed that the front end preparation work to get families ready around a family designed program, you know, ensured their success. Um, I'll just tell you the 2019 cohort, 88% found career pathways. They had some gaps um, when COVID hit, but um, seven, I want to say 78% are back at work. Um, and, and so, and all, all families were resilient through the worst parts of the pandemic for themselves, you know, their um, layoffs and all of that. So it's really um, having access to the parent through the school system, but not relying on the school system to do everything because they've got other things to do, but to be supportive of, of um, sort of that front end piece and that ongoing barrier mitigation um, part of, 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 of the work as it relates to the child. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll pause there, but I think schools can be a wonderful partner without putting unnecessary burden on having to manage programs because we have them. It's just that our referral system is just one off, one at a time, not cohort building, no social capital building. And so we've, we've changed that. Um, these, these Head Start parents still, still talk to each other without, um, and some of their kids aren't in Head Start anymore. They're in the, um, they're in the school system now. Um, and so they've, they've built a social capital network. They've built a resource team. Um, they're, they're, at, they're advocates for themselves. Oh, and by the way, their children's attendance is so much higher. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, Tiffany, I, I think Anne is singing your song. <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> So I'm going to throw that same question to you. We don't want to come back from COVID the way we were. We want a, a, a just and equitable recovery. What does it look like at your place? What are the key factors to build trust? Uh, well, I think the key piece there that you just, you know, in your question was the word equity. And I think that it really is to meet people where they're at and as a school department, you know, one of our, one of the things that I think our superintendent models every day is humility. And, you know, we always joke that like, we're all on the humble pie diet <laughs> and like everyone's position can be like, you know, be anything at any moment. Right. And so I think that that's, it's um, a culture we really need to continue to build because we are the, like, in many places, like a mandatory place for families to engage, right? And so, and oftentimes school departments can be transactional. Yes. And I think it really needs to shift that culture, that that background to be really relational building, social capital building. And I mean, really, Anne, without copying exactly what you said, but 
it really is that like there needs to be like, we don't need to provide every single thing to every single person, but we need to see the entire family. And I mean, really see them because, and be able to create and facilitate those relationships in the community, because we are never going to be able to jump into education. And, you know, we're talking about academic retention and all these things right now, and how to support students and achievement gaps and guess what? We're never going to get there if we're not addressing food, housing, care, all of these things. And so in my mind, it's like critical, number one, most important. What are the basic needs of the family? What do they need that is not in our job description? And that's what we just got to do. And so I think that that's in my mind, like key number one, before we can get back to like any normal place. Right. And so that means every department, food services, transportation, we're, we're gonna do all the things and, 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 and figure it out. And so, yeah, yeah I'll pause there, but. Yeah, it, it, it really sounds like we've come to a, a, a sort of a new understanding after COVID that all of the system that supports our communities are interlinked, right? You can't have just education, you need to have education, you need to have housing, healthcare, childcare, transportation, that if any one of those fail, we're not going to be able to do what we need to do. And the, and the three of you today really has validated for me how important that coherence is and, and, and that convergence is. So, so my, this is, we're going into our final round. I feel like a game show host. <laughs> we're going in for a final round. And, and this is kind of a round robin. Um, if you can imagine that there are a number of other districts watching this saying, I want to do that. So the question is, what advice would you give to, to community or, or school leaders who's looking to emulate your model? If someone, Elmi, wants to do co-design, what, what, what are, the, what are the, the, the pieces of advice that you would give them? I would say you, you, need, you really have to lay the foundation first. Um, what being a new superintendent a year ago, I was part of my entry plan when I heard in areas that we need to improve on was engaging families and community in authentic, more authentic ways. So that kind of led me to, to see, oh, okay, so this will, a, a pillar will be family and community engagement as I start a new superintendency. And so just building, building upon that, I, the community, the teachers, I think they were so hungry to engage families. We just hadn't made the efforts because you're just so busy with everything else. But then COVID presented this, like, you know, the silver lining and you can't let the crisis go to waste. And then we're thinking we're in remote learning and I don't know how long we're gonna be here when we have to engage our families somehow. We have to, we're not, they're not coming to the schools and we've got to engage our students and we've got to make sure our attendance rates are good. So how do we like, just like over the summer, like how do we do this? Like we got to figure something out. So we first, a little bit of a backdrop in the journey is we first started off with, okay, we're gonna have parent teacher conferences up front. But I'm like, we don't want to call those parent teacher conferences. So instead we, we call them trust visits. And it's like the trust visits happened on the sidewalks. We, we bought big tents and we put them outside so teachers could meet with families before school and have a physical connection. You know, everyone was masked and socially distanced. And then here's your little basket of books, supplies, art supplies, you name it here, take it, take it, the parents, here's your Chromebook. Do you have a hotspot? So we made that connection. So we started off doing professional development um, in our 10 day negotiation when school started. It was built into our memorandum of understanding that we would do some family and community engagement. I, I built it, we built it in and started there too. And so that was a precursor and then we had professional development where our wonderful um, Harvard intern did professional development on family and community engagement with our entire um, staff at every school. And so we set the foundation and there, there was just, just this eagerness and this thirst. And so then we, we started to co-design. 
And so that's what I would say. It, it, it happened, it evolved. And that's what I love about this work because it evolved. And, and, it, and, and there's so much ownership across the district with the people doing, with the, the educators who were doing this with our families, that it's such a beautiful partnership. And I have to say, if there's one silver lining in all of COVID, it's the family and community engagement that we've been able to do during this time. Because we now have 50, we have, we'll have 50 families come to a, a, a family night at the high school. Never have we had that much engagement at the high school. So we really figured out how, you know, it's like we, we're using this opportunity, but I think there needs to be some groundwork too of just why is family, why, why is family engagement so important? Why do we have to engage parents as our partners? Our parents are our children's first teacher. I'm, you know, so we just have to, you know, we just have to, like, I think uh, professional development first, but I, I, what I see is that our, our teachers, our administrators, they're so hungry for, for this professional development too. They love, they have really grasped onto this. So that's what I will say. Um, it's, it's just been a very unique um, outcome of COVID. It's been our silver, silver lining for sure. And uh, we'll just continue. We'll just continue and see where this takes us. Thank you, Ami. So, so Dr. Aveda says preconditions, professional development, make sure they're ready. And if you build it and it's ready, they'll come. Will they come in? They can come. You know, what I love is that, you know, the trusted relationship really can start at the school, but not everything has to happen in the school. And so, you know, as I look at some of the data and you all know this, you know, I mean, parents who complete a college degree double their incomes, right? A parent's level of educational attainment is also a strong predictor of a child's success. So when we look at, you know, what's missing, and again, you know, I'm listening to, I love hearing um, your perspectives right from the school, is, um, you know, the missing coordination of long-term long-term um, engagement. So the transactional engagement is where we've been. And that's, and, and when we talk about the many programs and services, I mean, we have 43 organizations doing workforce development, but only some of them do it really well. So we're engaging those organizations so that, um, so that we can provide those programs and services together. So over the last year, and we've really um, learned a lot over um, uh, um, various pilots, um, we, we've really got two new um, systems that really were organic in our community, which is, you know, how do we collaborate to engage families and help sort of get the ready, willing, and able so, so that more parents can become um, ready for work, training and work. But the second was, all, you know, also, um, you know, making sure that we're integrating that, that two generation approach to career pathways model. So you're clearing those obstacles for work, you know, workplace success, career advancement and economic mobility. And that really is, you know, we meet um, every week or every other week um, and go through, you know, what are the barriers? You know, what do we need to do together? And so the pressure is off any one organization to provide all of the interventions. And so when we, people kill me sometimes, but I say, you know, I, I kind of see there's, we have a lot of money in the system in certain ways. And, and, and this, our, our, our collaboration, our collective impact model has allowed us to see where the holes really are. And they definitely are at the very beginning, how we recruit parents, like I talked about before, just they're, you know, they may not be ready, willing, and able to work, um, but trusted advisors, two gen models, and a lengthier engagement provides you know, where now we can answer the question, is, is anyone better off after doing what they did? 18 months later, our first pilot, they're thriving. Um, so, you know, it's small, 
uh, but, but Holyoke Community College has done, adopted some of the whole family. Um, with, with us, we're partnering really closely with HCC, uh, not as much with STCC. I hope to increase our engagement, but I definitely want to increase our engagement with the public schools. Um, sometimes I think our schools find that um, if it's not for the kids, you know, then it doesn't belong here, but you all know differently. And, and I think um, and, and our teachers also know differently. Um, sometimes I think administration, they think innovation is better, but really depth, depth of and the quality of the engagement um, really is working. And so I think we can um, provide that missing coordination of relevant workforce development and coordination and policy advocacy, frankly. Um, we've, we're driving some new policy work from, from our learnings. And, and that's um, so important. Thank you, Anne. I, 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 that, that is a very, very cogent and powerful um, piece of advice for all of us who, some of us are flying from innovation to innovation and never quite plant a seed long enough for it to grow. That, that's very important. So Tiffany, you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really, I, I would echo a lot of the sentiments. I, I agree absolutely with Elmi and, and her approach. I think that, especially as a school department, one of the institutional pieces that we don't talk about enough is the unions. And you mentioned the MOU and discussing the importance of including those things in the MOU. And I, um, I also, as part of my role, co-chair all the professional development for the district. So I sat in on all the negotiations for professional development and we had to say family and community engagement must be a part of professional development and our culture building throughout the year. And yeah, and designing those 10 gifted days from DESE, that was the, the key in our professional development is that if we're telling our educators that we need to see the whole student, we also need to see our whole educator. And so those, those professional development is reflected, you know, absolutely the family and community engagement work, the anti-racism work we needed to do, the emotional well-being work. And I think that that's, that's really, I think, you know, my biggest takeaway is like, we need to walk the walk. And I think that what we're asking our educators and our teachers to do for our students and their parents and their families, we as administrators and, you know, systems people need to also do that for our educators. And, and it's hard, right? It's not easy to always figure all those pieces out. But I think as a district, we're, that's where we're striving because this is, to Anne's point, systems change. And we are trying to shift systems that have operated in a very confined and restricted way for many years. And that you know, requires an intense amount of humility, but also um, a large part of just open-mindedness and saying, hey, maybe we didn't get that right, right? And so you know, one of the things that we changed in our professional development this year is, is fully rolling out an ed camp model. So, you know, education for our educators by our educators, and it's not perfect and clean cut and all of these things, but that's, it's by design because we need to hear, we even have a workshop on Tuesday, which is our professional development day from students to talk about what they're facing right now and our teachers can attend. And I think that approach of like, seeing the whole child, but also seeing the whole educator is, is where we need to go before we can really go into like, you know, we're going to shift all the systems because if culturally and in their hearts, people aren't there because they may not understand it or have experienced it, that is where we need to start. So that's, that would be my, my piece. So, so it's so interesting that, that you have just rounded the circle back to what Almi first said, which is the precondition for planning and for, for, for implementation. And we are at, at the end of our time together. And I hope our audience have been able to um, see the three key themes that have run through our discussion, right? The, the alternative pathways to, to, to career and training and the shared leadership, not just between parent and child or parent and teacher, but really all the way around the um, our, um, our, our community. And, and the holistic learning that all of you are talking about, that we're not restricting it into an old model. And this is going to take us post COVID um, in my mind to a more just and more equitable recovery. So I thank all of you for, for being with us today for this wonderful conversation. And I urge our audience to, 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 to read our report and hear these echoes of our conversation today. 
But right now, I think I'm going to turn this back over to um, Chad Detremont to um, to round us up and close us off. Chad? Right. Thank you, Pam. And thank you for that summary and superb moderation. I think you helped us dig into all three themes, and that's greatly appreciated. I also want to thank our three panelists. I won't try to build on the insights that you provided. I don't think I have anything to add beyond what you shared. Maybe just one reflection about the passion and commitment to seeing the communities you're in, not as an audience to target or a group to engage, but that everyone was part of the same cause, the same purpose, really the same family, and having that perspective ran throughout all of the examples you shared. And I think that's a way forward for all of us in, in doing this work. So thank you to the four of you. We greatly appreciate you sharing. For those who are viewing this presentation and looking for the report or more information on the condition of education, it is on the Rennie Center's website, renniecenter.org, and we hope you'll seek it out there. Have a great afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on when you're listening to this presentation. Thank you, everyone.